the fullness of God. Those who've truly been with us, Jew and Gentile alike over the years, and have committed their ways to the to hail of the congregation, physically, spiritually, financially, and have seen and experienced radical transformation in their lives, have powerful testimonies that are real as they draw closer to God. And this is a key I desire to focus upon this evening. Why do we teach, express, and walk out obedience, submission, and drawing near to God, even in the Messianic movement? This and so many other questions abound in the greater body of Messiah. There are many unanswered questions, particularly in the Christian realm, and many, many false Messianic theologies are out there. Wolves in sheep clothing trying to deceive and destroy the sheep. In Jeremiah 23, starting at verse 1, it says, Oh no, the shepherds are destroying and scattering the sheep in my pasture, says Adonai. Therefore, this is what Adonai, the God of Israel, says against the shepherds who shepherd my people. You've scattered my flock, you've driven them away, and not taken care of them. So I will take care of you because of your evil deeds, says Adonai. I myself will gather what remains of my flock from all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their homes, and they'll be fruitful and increase their numbers. I will appoint shepherds over them who will shepherd them. Then they will no longer be afraid or disgraced, and none will be missing, says Adonai. I prophetically know that this is our mandate to be Adonai's appointed shepherd. That's the reason for the reemergence of the Messianic Jewish movement after 2,000 years. It's never disappeared. It's just been in abeyance until the last 50 years. This is our mission from Adonai. Week after week, I read article after article of the apostasy in the greater body of shepherds leading the sheep astray. We're also here to close this chasm, the divide between Jew and Gentile, to unlock the mysteries of the kingdom of Adonai and restore true righteous biblical leadership. Now let me begin with a rhetorical question. As a professed believer, are you, according to Scripture, commanded to draw closer to God? Do you, as a professed believer, desire to draw near to Him? Does God desire that after you receive Yeshua as your substitute sacrifice, you quit digging, quit searching, quit learning about Him and His kingdom? Does that or not want you to idly sit around waiting for your graduation for the shofar to sound? and you cross over into eternal life? Can you honestly say that you're searching the scriptures, that you're currently mining God's word to its fullest and maximum potential? Do you have a teachable spirit or is your heart hard, your ears plugged, and heart sluggish with fat? Are you walking in the fullness of the kingdom of God, healing the sick, raising the dead, walking in signs and wonders, and snatching the lost from the fire? As a Messianic rabbi, as a Messianic congregation swimming against the currents of contemporary religious and secular culture, there's a tendency to irritate Pharisees both in-house and out. And I'm amazed by the haughty, self-righteous religious elite who criticize, judge, and accuse us of Judaizing while they themselves are unable to heal the sick, raise the dead, and save the lost. It reminds me of one of my favorite life quotes by one of our greatest presidents, the 25th president of the United States of America, he said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, but because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But he, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows at the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. President Theodore Roosevelt. In order to receive the fullness of God, we first must get in the arena to strive valiantly, to have a teachable spirit, have an open mind, an open spirit, and be transparent while searching, seeking, and striving for kingdom truth and spirit and power. Shaul Paul shared in Romans 11, 11, the Gentiles were called to provoke the Jews to jealousy regarding the Messiah. He went on to say the conditions by which this would happen in Romans 11, verse 25. He said, for brothers, I, I want you to understand the truth which God formerly concealed, mysterion, which means mystery, a secret, a hidden, concealed, not fully manifested, but is now revealed so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness 
porosis, hardened, callous, blind, and sensitive stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness. Play Roma, which means it's filled, the body of believers filled with the presence, power, kingdom of God, and Yeshua. That with which a thing is filled, completeness, fullness of time, maturity. See, this is, we, there's been a stoniness over Israel's eyes until the Gentile world enters its maturity. It understands who it is and what it's grafted into. This is the time, this is the season for Romans 11.25 to come to pass. We're witnessing in some areas the maturity of the church, acknowledging its roots and engaging the biblical calendar. Shaul's talking about a truth, a fact that has been concealed, not fully manifested, that Israel would be in a state of blindness, a hardness, a callousness, insensitive regarding Yeshua until, and that's a capital, until the Gentile world enters its fullness, its maturity, the time, the season when the Gentiles enter into the full presence and power of the kingdom of God. This is both a somber warning and a prophetic statement. Shaul is warning that the Gentile body is not to imagine that they know more than they actually do. God is not done with Israel. We've not been replaced. Adonai's covenant with Israel remains forever. In fact, Yeshua returns at the request of the Jewish people. He will then rule the world from Jerusalem. This has been formally concealed until now as the Gentile body of believers is coming into its fullness, its maturity, the fullness of the kingdom and understanding that they are grafted into the Jewish rooted olive tree in Romans 11. What we share week after week is that there's so much more, more intimacy, more power, more signs and wonders, more supernatural revelations for you. It's the deep calling unto deep. But see, you've got to want it. To have the zeal, the fervency, you have to search it out. You have to investigate it. To be the good people of Berea and verify everything I say in the word every week. Amen. Do not take what I say for granted. Amen. There are so much more. Proverbs states, in chapter 25 of verse 2, God gets glory from concealing things. Kings get glory from investigating them. Why? Why is this? Why must things be concealed and hidden from us? Why isn't everything just laid out in plain sight for us on a silver platter? Why did Yeshua speak in parables? Because it causes one to investigate, to read the word, to pray, to concentrate on heavenly things. It separates those who belong to Yeshua and those who do not. The Talmudim themselves asked Yeshua in Matthew 13, starting at verse 10. Then the Talmudim came and asked Yeshua, why are you speaking to them in parables? And he answered, because it has been given to you to know the secrets, mysterion, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. For anyone who has something will be given more, so that he will have plenty. But from anyone who has nothing, even what he does have will be taken away. Here is why I speak to them in parables, verse 13. They look without seeing and listen without hearing or understanding. That is, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Yeshayahu, which says, you will keep on hearing but never understand, keep on seeing but never perceive. Because the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they barely hear, with their eyes they have closed, so as not to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and do teshuva so that I could heal them. Yeshua established a divine criteria regarding who his Talmudim are and who are not. His Talmudim, his chosen, will know the secrets, the mysteries, the fullness of the kingdom. Those who are willing to forsake everything they have and ever known to be his Talmudim, his disciples. Those willing to forsake the love and material excess of this world. Those who will repent of religious rituals and the sins of Jeroboam and Hellenistic knowledge will see and experience an increase of the fullness of the kingdom. Most of today's body of believers in general want reason, vice revelation. This is why Yeshua prayed what he did in Luke 24, starting at verse 44. Yeshua said to them, this is what I meant when I was still with you and told you that everything written about me in the Torah of Moshe, the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that he could understand the Tanakh. That's a powerful statement. He opened their minds. See, it's not the New Testament mentioned here, not the epistles, but the Tanakh, which is graphes in the Greek. In other translation, this says scriptures. So that's very misleading. This is why translations are so critical when we read the word of God. Amen. When Yeshua said this, there was no gospel. There was no epistles, no letters. The New Testament is 350 years in the future. See, the core of my teachings 
reflects biblical culture, Israeli culture, Hebrew idioms, Torah, and other teachings from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brachadasha, the New Testament. I don't do this because we're a Messianic synagogue and it's expected. As a congregational leader, I have a mandate. I have a commission, a responsibility to bring you to the fullness of God through Yeshua and all of his word. Amen. Not part of it, not half of it, but all of it. Every congregational leader in the greater body of Messiah has the same position, no matter the title. Every congregational leader has the same mandate, the same commission to make disciples, to meet in singular, or Talmudim in plural in Hebrew, based solely upon the entire word of God. The drosh is the message you hear from me week after week, and the manner in which I present them is to bring clarity and understanding to the mysteries Yeshua is communicating through his idioms, parables, and teachings. See, we must understand the cultural context of how, where, when, and to whom Yeshua was speaking to. Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, came to the lost house of Israel according to his own world's own words. He traveled the nation of Israel, commissioning and training the 12 Jewish men to be his own Talmudim or disciples. He celebrated and kept Shabbat. It says in Luke, it was his custom. He went to synagogue on Shabbat. What would Jesus do? Go to synagogue on Shabbat. He observed and celebrated all the biblical feast days and out of the temple in Jerusalem or the synagogue at whatever town he was currently in. He used every available opportunity to teach and bring his followers into the fullness of God. As Shaul said, Paul said about Yeshua in Colossians 2 verse 9, for in him bodily lives the fullness of all that God is. Unfortunately, most contemporary Gentile discipleship training today teaches adherence to doctrine or denominational theology. Most Jewish discipleship training teaches adherence to oral traditions, the Talmud, and rabbis, neither of which was what Yeshua was teaching 2,000 years ago. Neither existed in Yeshua's time. I get into arguments all the time in our own community. We're going back to the Judaism of, of Jesus' time. No, we're not. Because Judaism didn't exist 2,000 years ago. Judaism came about because of the destruction of the temple and no more sacrifices. The Bible doesn't work without a blood sacrifice. So if you didn't receive Yeshua, you got a problem. And they tried to resolve it with 36 volumes of oral traditions, which didn't resolve the problem. A disciple or tamid in Hebrew is one who mimics the teacher, the Rav, one of the 12 of the inner circle of Yeshua's followers, according to the Gospels, a convinced adherent of an individual. We're called by Yeshua to become a Talmudim, people who mimic his behavior, which is not the same as a believer. The book of James states that Hasetan is a believer, but he's not a Talmudim, he's not a disciple. See, the greater body suffers from amnesia, a deficit in memory. Most of today's believers have forgotten who they are and what they've been grafted into and what the Word says. Worst case or scenario, they have selective memory. In James 1, verse 25, it says, But if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom and continues becoming not a forgetful, Epileis mone, forgetfulness or forgetful, not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. See, a non-disciple, a believer, a spectator, vice participator, doesn't learn the ways of the kingdom of God. They're forgetful hearers, vice doer of the word. Epileis mone is only used one time in the entire Bible, and it's in this scripture. Don't forget Many attend services across the land for the, an emotional moment, for charismatic worship, but they don't change their lifestyle. They won't perform teshuva and lay everything down to receive the fullness of God that Yeshua can save them and heal them. They come to be entertained by its being transformed. Receiving the fullness of God isn't just timing. It also requires a correct alignment with God's word, his kingdom, his son, and his ruach hakodesh. The disciple, the unteachable, are content to do things the way it's always been done, like they were trained to do. Like in Yeshua's day, the multitudes are too self-absorbed in themselves, as he said back in Matthew 13, verse 15, because the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they barely hear. With their eyes, they have closed. So as not to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and do Teshuva so that I could heal them. God's heavenly purpose behind mysteries and parables is to leave clues for the true Talmudim. Nothing gives me greater zeal to come across a passage, look up the Hebrew term, and go, huh? Days, weeks, months I've studied words, and it would be six months later before a message comes forth. 
That it's a driving force. God, what are you saying in this? What are you telling me? Mysteries and parables draw us closer to him. We gravitate towards him. It spurns. It inspires us to follow the clues. It energizes us to dig deeper, to know more, to get intimate with him, to obtain everything he has for us, missing nothing. This is the essence of the fullness of God, to walk and live in and experience the indwelling, the indwelling of God's presence, not a visitation. I don't want an intermittent visitation. I want an indwelling of the fullness of the Most High God, Amen. the living God of Israel. The fullness of God manifests in the person through radical courage, boldness, signs of wonders, through repentance, tithing, coupled with heartfelt, passionate expressions of praise, thanksgiving and worship, and fear of the Lord. It's a manifestation and demonstration of God's sovereign power within you, which advances the spread of the good news, the gospels, the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Not living in the fullness of God is like owning a vehicle with every option available, but the salesman tells you, he taught you, he trained you, those options are all done away with. So you insert the key in the ignition, or maybe you push the button these days, you place the vehicle in drive, you transport yourself around in the most basic fundamental way. It does work, but it's very rudimentary. Limited fashion, far short of the vehicle's potential. No options are utilized, so you sweat in the summer and you freeze in the winter. You have a hard time seeing in front of you because the windshield's fog is dirty and streaks when it rains and snows. But you were told, you're trained, you're convinced that the wipers are done away with. You're trained, taught that put in the key in the ignition, that's enough. That's all you've got to do. The reality is that you have all these resources and all these tools right at your fingertips. All you had to do was reach out and turn on the wiper blades, and you could clearly see. As Yeshua told us, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. It's among us. You don't drive at night because you aren't utilizing the headlights. You don't take others along with you because you're told and taught there are many other paths, many other vehicles out there, so all your seats remain empty. You don't know where you're at because you're not using the built-in navigation system, the feast days. Everything you need to maximize your drive, your experience, and navigate to your destination, day or night, in any weather condition, and bring others along with you, it's been given to us. Just reach out, open the glove box, and read the owner's manual. All you got to do is pick up your Bible, the start of Genesis 1, and start reading. The entire thing, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. All the warning lights are explained, all the operating instructions for the air, heat, the wiper blades, headlamps, turn signals, navigation system, all those lights on the dash, everything's right there. But we stubbornly refuse because our deceptive religious training and teaching tells us that it's all done away with. Or better yet, these options are only for when the car was old. It's for back in the old days. It's not for now. The body has taught all those options are unnecessary while we grope through the darkness, bumping into things, having accidents, getting lost, unable to see what's before us, where we're going, and the dangers lurking our path. We just keep looking through that same mud-smeared, foggy streak, dirty windshield in the dark, without the headlights on, not signaling those around us, with empty seats, lost, praying something would happen, when in reality, it's all just at hand. We're just denying it. The options are there for every driver, every believer, Jew and Gentile. It doesn't matter. As we read in Ephesians 3, starting at verse 5. In past generations, it was not made known to mankind. As the Spirit, as the Ruach, is now revealing it to his emissaries and prophets. That in union with the Messiah, and through the good news, the Gentiles were to be joint heirs, a joint body, joint shares with the Jews in what God has promised. There's only two people groups, Jew and Gentiles. And those two groups were separated and so grieved God that he sent his only son to shed his blood to make those two one. I had a conversation, phone call this week. The person's watching. One of our original congregates that was here the first night we had a Shabbat. Person can't drive in the evening right now. But the person was sharing we, with me on the phone, and, and I already know this, that they're part black and part indigenous Native American. And the person said they were sharing that with somebody, and then somebody stopped and said, that's, no, that's not true, you're biracial. That really is a problem for me. See, because black people, you're part of the human race. Indigenous people, human race. Oriental people, human race. Hispanics, human race. White Europeans, human race. 
Jewish people, human race. We're all of the same race. Biracial is like a minotaur with a bull head and a person's body, which, by the way, is impossible. If you're biracial, you can't replicate. You with me? Any more in forms? You know what I put down? For race, human. You understand? Every one of those forms is divisive. Se- who, who separates us into these groupings? Hasetan. The only two people groups God sees is Jew and Gentile. And that so grieved him that they, we were reconciled together as one in Messiah through the blood of Messiah Yeshua. But we all share the same power, the same grace, the same mercy, the same blessings, the same calendar, the same Holy Spirit, the same Messiah, the same Bible, the same scriptures. We're to be echad in relationship with each other and with the Lord. The whole Megillah, every option is yours. It's available for you to draw closer to him, allowing you to live and walk in the fullness of him. God doesn't command you to do the bare minimum, the least amount necessary to get saved, then stand on the sidelines and wait for it to all end. Is merely saying the prayer of salvation enough? Uh, No. God desires, he expects, he commands action on your part to chase after him, to pursue him, to learn, discern, investigate, align, crucify your flesh and your old desires and transform and conform yourself to his kingdom, not your fleshly carnal desires. Religion or doctrines or the ways of the world around you. Romans 12, 2 It says, in other words, don't let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the alum, Hosea, to this world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed. Metamorpho, which is the word that we all, it's a root word for the word we know, metamorphosis. To change, to transform, to transfigure by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. Now that's the million dollar question. What does God want? He tells you clearly in the 66 books of his word, the scriptures, the Bible, 39 books in the Tanakh, and 27 books of the Brahadashah. Yet again, when this was written, there was no New Testament. We are changed, we're transformed to reflect the fullness of God, the kingdom of God, as recorded in the Tanakh, by the renewing of our minds, just as Yeshua prayed back in Luke 24, to open their minds, to open their ears, eyes, and understanding of the heart. It's a renewing. A renewing, as a sage once told me, The closer you come to God, the more Jewish you begin to look. This text, this passage, this next one gives a profound word from God that sums up this entire message and where America is at spiritually today. This following passage gives critical revelation that that communicates we must have boldness to come into the fullness of God. See, it's, it's not easy. It's something you have to concentrate on, something you have to press into. But when you do, you get the full blessings and outpourings from heaven. Speak into a divided kingdom. Adonai spoke through Azariah, reflecting upon the sins of Jeroboam in Israel. This is false man-made religion. Vice a personal, intimate relationship with God sought in Judah. In 2 Chronicles 15, starting at verse 1, it says, The Ruach Elohim came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. He went out to meet Azah, and he said to him, Listen to me, Azah, all Judah and Benjamin, Adonai is with you as long as you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will spurn you. For many days Israel was without the true God, without a teaching Cohen and without Torah. But in their distress, they turned to Adonai, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. This can't be any simpler. If you've plateaued, if you're in a dry spell, if you're not feeling his presence, seek after him. Because if you seek after him, you'll find him. He'll let you find him. Verse 5, in those times there was no shalom for anyone coming or going, for there were many conflicts among all the inhabitants of the land. My goodness, does that talk about America today? Numerous conflicts, no shalom in the land. Verse 7, but you, kazakh. This is a battle cry. Kazakh amats. Do not let your hands be slack, for there is reward for your labor. When Asa heard these words, as well as the prophecy of the prophet Oded, he took courage and removed the abominations from all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and from the towns that he had seized in the hill country of Ephraim, he also repaired Adonai's altar that was in front of Adonai's entryway. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin, as well as those dwelling with him from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, for many 
Many had defected. I love this. Many had defected to him from Israel when they saw that Adonai, his God, was with him. See, we don't, you don't need to pass out flyers. We don't need snazzy TV commercials or billboards. We don't need smoke machines and coffee machines out in the lobby. Those estranged from God will defect to us when they hear and see that Adonai, the God of Israel, is with us. Amen. The fullness of Adonai is the totality of everything that he is, his attributes, his character, his perfection, his holiness, his majesty, his power, his love, his glory, his grace, his mercy, also his judgment and wrath, his redemptive nature. The fullness of God is his complete nature. It is who he is. And when Adonai is with us, it draws all unto him, and we live in shalom. Choose this day whom you shall serve. The continued sins of Jeroboam, or will you choose the fullness, the power, the kingdom, the word, the Ruach HaKodesh, Yeshua, the Son of God? Are you at the bare minimum, or do you desire more? In 1996, I was engaged in a weekly men's prayer group. And these guys were some real intercessors. And we were fervently praying for revival, for an outpouring right here. Now, this is years before Congregation Zion State got started. And after about a month of this, the Lord began moving profoundly. And there were services going on here every night, seven days a week. This was in the summertime. We brought the kids, we're bits and brought crayons and coloring books. They would sleep underneath the pews. But we came here every night. The founding pastor here, Pastor Collins, some nights he would speak. Other times, national renowned guest speakers heard something that was going on here and they just showed up. Dick Rubin, Tommy Tenney, Franklin Jensen, Sid Roth, Sidney Jacobs, John Bevere. This is just but a few. There was more. And they all had prophetic words for that founding and senior pastor, Bobby Collins. The second week into this, he went on a vacation. But he couldn't stand it because he knew something's happening here. And he would come right through that door right there, sneak in the back. Now, half these people coming here, they don't know who he is. But they all had prophetic words. And they would walk right up to him and say, and again, most of them didn't know it, you won't understand what's happening but you're going to look and start dressing Jewish. The Lord said, I'm doing a new thing here. I, Adonai, I'm bringing about restoration. I'm reaching out to you, my chosen people. I'm bringing new things to you that aren't, you're not familiar with. People will be confounded. And, and every time they get in this word, he, boom, he just fell out in the chair. Some, whoa, something was happening. Just a few years later, I had my own, not even, I had my own road to Damascus encounter and CZF started. And you know what's ironic? That those that were involved in that outpouring refused to acknowledge what God was doing. We don't want this Jewish stuff. We don't want this Judaizing. We don't want, we don't want none of this stuff. Dozens of families left but I'll give credit to Pastor Collins. He never batted an eye. He stood with us. He supported us. Gave us the building to use every Friday night. Here we are 24 and a half years later. We're still here. And there's a lot more people here than the initial 15 that was here that first night. See, living in the fullness of Adonai requires obedience to follow whatever he does, whatever is being poured out, whether it fits into your pre preconceived notions or religious understanding or not. We pray out to God, he does something. Whoa, no, 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 no. I, I don't want that. That's not our place. Our place is to say Hanani. Hanani. And you know, sadly, that outpouring, that revival stopped. And we had a profound revelation. 
I'm not going to mention the other two places here. It's been too many years ago. <laughs> this is a hard one. The Lord said, you weren't my first choice. The Lord says, you're my third choice. You know, that's like being picked last for dodgeball. <laughs> but I tell you what, I didn't want there to be a fourth. And sadly, that outpouring, that revival stopped. It's never happened again. We have incredible, powerful moves here. We've had intense conferences. God has blessed. God has done supernatural things. But we've got to get back. And, and receiving that fullness of God requires a complete open mind. Let Yeshua open your mind that you can understand everything that's happening. To receive that fullness because time is running out. There's a great urgency in the hour. That shofar is about to sound. And when that happens, it's all over. There's no more old time religion, no more traditions or rituals. Blink of an eye, Shaul says, a 64th of a second. You can't even grunt in that amount of time let alone say, Lord, I'm sorry. What that means is we have to get it right now. Right now. We're again at that juncture. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. Let's rise. I shared this a couple of years ago. I'll share it again because it's relevant. I was at a pastor's meeting. Of course, I'm the only Jew there. And someone on the right asked me how things are going, and we're, we're chatting. And I said something about, I can't even remember what it was, something about Israel. This has been about seven or eight years ago. And the guy on my left, the pastor on the left, says, Oh, man. Blah, 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 blah. Israel, Jews, Israel, Jews, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, <laughs> oh, are you going to be unhappy when that shofar sounds? Matter of fact, you may not be going to the wedding feast. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. It's ignorance of the word. Father, in Yeshua's name, I, I'm praying right now. For everyone that's hearing my voice here online on the Oasis Network, that Yeshua would open their minds to receive the fullness of your kingdom. That we would have zero limitations on our walk with you that we would walk in the fullness and the power, that we would heal the sick and raise the dead and push back strongholds and principalities. Father, I'm praying the fullness of your kingdom in each and every one of us. That when Hasetan and his minions come across us, they say, whoa! Father, I'm praying for that light to shine profoundly from your children. Father, I'm praying for complete understanding in them. That zeal, that desire for your word to search, to mine your word for truth and power and spirit. That we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we desire to pant after you as a deer panteth after the water. We desire the fullness of your Holy Spirit in us, the fullness of all your gifts, zero limitations. That's your promise to each and every one of us, not for the rabbi, not for the pastor, but for every one of us. And let us move and operate in that power and that fullness as we move forward in these end days. 
In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. And amen. If you just stay here for a second, and we'll seal this with the ironic. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. Kazakamat. Be bold. Be very bold. Shabbat shalom.